Okay, well, I think we should go ahead and get started because we have a lot to cover tonight. So again, to everyone who has joined us tonight, I wanna to welcome you. This is the fourth class in the class series of LaRouche's, Lyndon LaRouche's Economics on the Science of Physical Economy and Basics of Physical Economy. Uh, the first three classes have been given by Ben Denniston, who will be joining us tonight for the discussion, and also Brian Lance. Brian's going to take up a bulk of the discussion tonight, but he and I are so somewhat going to divide up that discussion because we're taking up the subject of why do L Lyndon LaRouche and Donald Trump say we have to go to Mars? And this as important key in the whole deliberative process, which we've been outlining in the last three classes of this class series. What does it take to increase the productivity of your society to bring about a national mission orientation? We're gonna get into that more. Brian talked about last week, machine tool design and manufacturing. If you hadn't had a chance to look at that, that's on our website. And also you can find it on the YouTube channel of LaRouchePack.com. Before we get into the meat of the discussion though, I just wanna make a quick announcement that we at LaRouche Pack are, are going to be putting out a new petition. It will be up on the website, LaRouchePack.com. And you should look for that by tomorrow. And I encourage everyone to sign it. The petition is going to be titled, Hands Off Trump, Hands Off America. And without going into the details now, you, everyone should be aware of the escalated and continued targeting of our American Republic uh, and the targeting of the former 44th, 45th president, uh, Donald Trump of the United States. And this is not just an attack on President Trump, but it's an attack on our commitment to the future. And this must be stopped. And we're gonna discuss tonight in this context of the, the title of our discussion, why Lyndon LaRouche and Trump have said that we have to go to Mars is one of the things that the same enemy operation that targeted LaRouche almost 30, 40 years ago and waged a witch hunt and campaign against him said that his policy for going to Mars and advancing the industrial and scientific progress of mankind was ludicrous. And they called him, you know, more than just crazy for having a Mars colonization program. And now, um, several decades after Lyndon LaRouche announced his Woman on Mars, Mars terraforming and colonization program as the greatest second, as the greatest economic driver since the Apollo program of John F. Kennedy. Uh, now you have President Donald Trump who initiated the Artemis program, which calls for returning American astronauts to the moon and industrializing the moon for development of going eventually to Mars. So for the first time, what Kennedy planned, which was stifled and Lyndon LaRouche took up the mantle now under Donald Trump, that was reinitiated through the Artemis program. And so one of the things I want to, as we get into the discussion a little bit more, is to talk about why this is important. First of all, simply to say that space drives human progress and that there are no limitations to growth at, uh, contrary to the, the zero growth anti-human, anti-science operations that are governing the avatar Joe Biden administration, because contrary to the fact that Biden has said he wants to continue the Artemis program, the moon landing program and the Mars program, you cannot do this as I explained very much so in an article that I, I recently published on LaRouche Pack entitled, Can NASA Launch Humans to Mars Under a Crashing Green Agenda? And this is absolutely impossible because if the agenda for NASA is 
a environmentalist green agenda to focus on putting funding toward climate change and not toward scientific and technological progress and toward a full Mars colonization or the terraforming of Mars, then you can't achieve such a bold initiative as LaRouche laid out and as was continued by President Trump. And so you look at the difference here where President Trump wanted to put more funding into the advancement of resources for the moon and for Mars, uh, contrary, Joe Biden right now and uh, his entourage are calling for uh, pay paying a climate advisor by the name of Gavin Smith, who is going to be putting more focus on how we spend more money on reducing anthropogenic carbon emissions, why carbon is bad. So uh, we'll talk about that more in a little bit. But you see the contrasting views here, the zero growth policy versus the pro growth po policy. So, so let's discuss this. A Mars colonization program and any economic program of development starts with the idea of advancing human, human creativity, of human discovery, of our extraterrestrial imperative. Uh, Mr. LaRouche used to talk about the fact that Kennedy once said, you know, why do we go to the moon and brought up the answer from the man who climbed my Mount Everest and said, because it's there. <laughs> and, and so that's, that's a, an example, a reason. Yes, we want to go because we should explore it. It's out there. We should explore the moon. We should explore Mars. We should explore other planets as we are doing right now with our instruments on Mars with the Perseverance rover, because we're not just there uh, with these instruments. We're there because we're paving the way for expounding on the full uh, extraterrestrial imperative of mankind. How do we pave the way for human beings to get to Mars? And this is being done by many nations uh, as we are experiencing right now. The United States has been uh, on Mars with its rovers now for decades with five rovers, including the Perseverance that's there now. We've just established powered flight on Mars. We are also at this point um, working with an instrument on Mars, Mars called the MOXIE instrument. And it is actually uh, preparing and, and giving us insight as to how to extract uh, oxygen from Mars, uh, how to create oxygen on Mars with this uh, from the car carbon atmosphere. So, and recently we just learned that China made a successful landing, the nation of China for the first time with its Tianhuan-1 mission and has now deployed its rover, uh, Zhurong, uh, the a rover that is now on Mars and we're looking for life on Mars. What is it going to take to sustain human life on Mars? And these are the programs we're going through. And this is what Linda LaRouche laid out um, as a plan, a 30-year perspective, not just to snap our finger and to get to Mars as a great thing to do, but this is how you build out an entire industrialization uh, program. And we're going to, Brian's going to get into that more in detail shortly here. But we're talking about Linda LaRouche's 40 year Mars colonization program uh, was essentially to develop what was necessary as a science driver for increasing your productive labor force and the productive standards of living of your population, for transforming the earth for going against this idea of limitations to resources and zero growth, uh, contrary to the Malthusian policies that have dominated our society for a very long time. And this means uh, increased and great investments in scientific and technological advancements as the Artemis program 
has the potential proposed under President Trump uh, to represent right now as, as the greatest economic recovery program and national science driver mission since the 1960s moon landing crash program as Mr. LaRouche defined it. And this is what we have to be committed to. So lastly, what I want to before, what I want to bring into the discussion is, okay, what are the challenges we face? Um, what is it going to take to get this done? Uh, Mr. LaRouche, during the development of his Mars colonization program laid out two obstacles that we face in, a, uh, in doing so, uh, a numerous obstacles, but two essential obstacles that we would face. Um, and this includes one, getting off the earth and the need for improved sources of energy to power the spacecraft and provide abundant energy uh, to sustain what we call an Earth-like artificial environment on Mars. Yeah, so mastering the uh, mastering uh, propulsion systems, increased propulsion systems, because people, I think everybody knows that it takes 900 days, uh, excuse me, yeah, nine, 900, it takes nine months, excuse me, to get to Mars approximately. That's a very long time. You know, how, how are, some people are trying to figure out how to build spacecraft with bubbles around it to protect from the radio, radiation environment. Uh, and what are you gonna do in terms of how, how you're going to take your resources with you? So the two, two areas of obstacles and challenges we have to meet are one, uh, increasing energy sources for space travel, cutting the time to get to Mars, and two, uh, once you get to Mars and even in between, creating the food production. Uh, people have to eat. How are you going to sustain uh, growth, master biotechnology for food production and growing food in space? And so I want to give an example of that on the first challenge. I'm not going to touch on too much except right now, except, and this can come up in discussion, for to say that uh, and to mention that uh, Lyndon LaRouche had a very concrete plan in terms of cutting the time for travel to Mars. Uh, he laid out an extensive plan for developing net rates of acceleration to Mars, uh, Mars bound vehicles to produce the effects of Earth gravity. And we can get into this a little bit more, this idea of acceleration and halfway through decelerating um, and creating this process, developing this process through uh, the development of controlled thermonuclear fusion. We should have been there a long time ago in terms of the mastery of uh, fusion, thermonuclear fusion propulsion systems. It would have transformed not just our travel in space, but our product, our process here on Earth. And we can talk about that more and, and Ben may want to bring in and add on that point. Um, the other point that I made was growing ecosystems, plant production on Mars. This is a big thing uh, because we're, talk, uh, we're talking about, you know, how you're going to create an Earth-like or sustain life, you know, create air to breathe and food, most importantly. And so there are a couple of uh, ways in, that this is being discussed. Uh, first, first of all, Lyndon LaRouche in his program called for building up the Mars atmosphere. And uh, there is an interesting article that I just read uh, discussing the fact of building an artificial atmosphere on Mars by uh, creating a artificial magnetosphere. And we can get into that, uh, you know, maybe a little bit later or so, um, because that I don't, I haven't had a chance to look at it more, but that would be important because Mars does not have a uh, active magnetosphere. And if you want to create a certain artificial environment, 
maybe that's the way to do it. But on the question of um, food production, creating, Lurish called for uh, bubble covered agro industrial complexes with hydroponic uh, agricultural systems. And this is something that's being worked on right now with NASA, where you have uh, NASA is working develop, to develop uh, such hydroponic systems. For example, they're working on a project with the university. Uh, and let me see if I can show you this. This is probably the only picture I had here. Uh, OK, very good. So uh, very, very interesting. Um, this is what NASA is working on with, um, with the University of Arizona right now in developing a, the, a hydroponic system. So this is a, like a lunar greenhouse, what we would need for developing ecosystems, plant systems on the moon and on Mars. And it works through uh, it's about this lunar greenhouse is about 18 feet, eight feet in diameter. It is organized through water, water enriched through nutrients that flow continuously through the, the roots of those plants that you see there. Um, and uh, the idea is that you're going to, as the carbon dioxide is exalted by astronauts, for instance, on Mars, then that would be absorbed through the photosynthesis of the plant life and build a bio uh, regenerative life support system. So that's one example there. Another example just quickly is uh, that students from a NASA challenge that was put out um, on plant growing plant life in space, students from New Jersey are developing a aquaponic uh, system methods for for growing plants that marry hydroponics like this uh, with aquaculture culture and the raising of aquatic life in a closed loop system or closed loop environment. So you have plants and fish that will be working together to create a balanced mini ecosystem to grow in. So. That's just to give you some examples here um, of where we are, and we're going to get further into that. But now I'm going to turn it over to Brian. Uh, in doing so, I'm going to say uh, we're not just going to snap our fingers and get to Mars. We have to develop an entire infrastructure platform, and we need to develop between low Earth orbit and cislunar uh, and the cislunar space and the full industrialization, uh, lunar industrialization. And Brian's going to take us now into how we build out that platform to get to Mars. So go ahead, Brian. OK, good to be with everyone tonight. Thank you, Keisha. Good to be with you and Ben. And uh, thank you all for joining us. And we hope you'll, uh, if you haven't already signed up for this, uh, these broadcasts on LaRouchePack.com, uh, please do so. Uh, because there's an extensive Q&A session. And uh, when uh, we replay these on YouTube, on the LaRouchePack.com channel on YouTube, those Q&A uh, questions are not part of that uh, because that's just kept as a private dialogue discussion. So, uh, but by signing up, uh, then you have access to that Q&A. So I, uh, I just uh, mentioned that uh, as something you may want to do if you haven't already. So, um, so I think uh, just to go ahead here, I'm going to start with the first uh, slide. Uh, um, th this is a this is a a, 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 a really nice drawing of uh, Larouche's design for a city on Mars. Uh, Larouche, the political e economist and and statement uh, statesman, uh, physical economist. Uh, each one of those spheres that you see surrounding the central sphere. And, and you may notice there's an atmosphere inside that central sphere. Um, but each one of those surrounding spheres uh, partially built underground uh, uh, are large enough to house 100,000 people a, a piece. So just to give you a sense of the, the, the scale uh, of uh, what was designed. And, and uh, uh, 
uh, and the uh, proposal uh, that Mr. Lurich developed did draw a, a very uh, significant attention from, from um, NASA um, uh, planners and so forth at the time. They were very, uh, they were fascinated with this, uh, uh, with this show or with this uh, uh, program that LaRouche was developing. Uh, but I want to uh, just go then to the, uh, go to the uh, concept of uh, back to last week uh, to, the, uh, to this flow chart of uh, the development of, of, uh, of, of machine tools and, um, and similar uh, mechanisms, certain tools uh, advanced tools, uh, and you'll see there at the at the start that you start with, you know, with with principles, discovery of of unique physical principles, uh, 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 the, uh, a, a seeking for applications. This is a question of human creativity, discovering uh, often through the uh, through anomalous uh, 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 behaviors. Uh, um, findings in nature that, that contradict existing knowledge, man's forced to reframe, to rethink uh, the universe around him. And, um, and uh, uh, in the course of this, come up with new insights, new discoveries, and of course, to then test those new ideas and discoveries. Uh, and in testing them, uh, you have the beginnings, you have the Elemental beginnings of, a, of breakthroughs, which can be cultural, uh, because of the implications, the implications for society and how society is organized, not just objectively but subjectively, uh, in terms of culture. Um, but also uh, 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 physically, in terms of prototypes for new machines uh, uh, for man. Uh, in his relationship with nature, making physical changes on nature for man. And uh, so this flow chart simply traces out that process. Uh, and I bring that forward to just reemphasize that, that, uh, that what we're really interested here in terms of developing the concept of physical economy as Marusha developed them originally uh, is to, to, to identify the human personality, the unique individual human personality as, as the basis for the concept of economy going forward. That is that economics, when we think of economics as opposed to supply and demand and the stock market and the casino industry and the tourism industry and the service industry, all this nonsense, that instead we look at economy first and foremost, we put man at the center, men and women at the center and their unique individual creative potentials as the real basis of, of economics uh, as expressed here is really the source of this flow chart, this process of, of elaboration and development. But also if you look at the bottom again of the flow chart, starting with individual creative reason at the top, flowing on through, uh, you have then as a consequence, as a result, higher levels of development of individual creative reason as the product of this, of, of this process. Um, now, now this is this, the unique creative individual is the source of, of this, is the critical real deep content of, uh, of infrastructure, of the function, the economic function of infrastructure. That the, the deeper concept of infrastructure as a, as, as a series of increasingly uh, profound, more profound, uh, enriched platforms for development is the way in which those platforms by implication enrich the noetic quality of, of society, the noetic content of culture, uh, of science, of, of, uh, of, uh, of our cultural institutions and so forth. That this is what we're striving for. 
Now, let's go to the very real implications for some of this, thinking about some of this, in terms of starting with the International Space Station. As indicated here in this slide, the Artemis program that Keisha was talking about alone has 3,800 suppliers. 3,800, these are 3,800 companies around the United States that are producing product for the Artemis program alone. Uh, this map, map uh, a NASA map, just indicates just kind of in, in a sketch um, the, the breadth and depth of this. It covers all 50 states. Uh, are involved simply in the Artemis project. This is a multiplier. This is not simply supplying to NASA, but these are uh, by and large companies that themselves are becoming more productive, are, are, are stretching the limits of their own knowledge to produce high-end products, uh, alloys, uh, 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 sensors, uh, uh, software, um, uh, engines, uh, all of this uh, that that go into uh, the Artemis mission, uh, and the Artemis mission uh, involves over 35 separate launches uh, to the moon. Uh, so, uh, so this is now. Now think about the International Space Station. We we've, we've got seven astronauts up there from various countries right now. That's that's the normal. Uh, uh, number on the space station at any one time, although we can, they can certainly go much higher. Um, at any at any time, up to 250 science projects, research projects are going on at the International Space Station at any time. Uh, there's a, there's an, an entire control center um, uh, with Jet Propulsion Laboratory and with uh, Houston. Uh, that uh, are overseeing, that are monitoring these research projects, as well as, be, of course, being monitored and overseen by astronauts themselves uh, on the space station. But many of these projects are, are uh, automated um, uh, programs that can be, uh, uh, can be uh, monitored from Earth. Um, uh, the temperatures maintained in the various experiments, food supply, and so forth. Uh, but this is, this is the ISS, the International Space Station is already has been probably now more than ever uh, a research facility for our nation and also by extension for mankind. Um, there's over a hundred partners directly with the International Space Station. Partners are called uh, implementation partners. These are companies that are involved in these research projects, 250 at any given moment, there's a rapid turnover of these projects. So you're talking about tens of thousands of these projects over the 20 plus years of, uh, of the ISS existence. But you have uh, commercial companies, life sciences, physical sciences, remote sensing, technology development. These are some of the major categories that are working directly through the ISS National Laboratory. There's an ISS National Laboratory on the International Space Station. Uh, and uh, and uh, the research projects and so forth on the space station are coordinated uh, through that, um, that organization. Now let's get some into uh, further into this. What we really wanna talk about is launching a new platform. And that's what I'm gonna be primarily talking about here is launching that new platform that will re represent an increase in the productive capacities, the creative capacities as Keisha was talking about uh, of the people of our nation and particularly looking forward to the next generation and the generation after this. And so I'm gonna move through here very rapidly some of these projects underway. I've I've just chosen as the first example, these, this is the commercialization process underway at NASA. Uh, on March 23rd of this year, of 2021, uh, NASA, uh, NASA held an, an industry briefing on their program to move to the rapid commercialization of low Earth orbit. Uh, in other words, moving away from the space station, uh, whose uh, lifespan is finite, 
but moving away specifically to commercialization. Commercial companies developing commercial um, manufacturing facilities, research facilities is a fly alone uh, project that is not attached to the ISS, but uh, 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 on their own in near, near Earth orbit. Um, um, there were dozens of companies represented there and NASA announced that they're going to be budgeting 40, $400 million uh, that will be uh, issued in the uh, uh, final quarter of this year uh, uh, for funding uh, from two to four uh, specific companies based on their programs for the development of, uh, of uh, space stations, if you will. Um, they give them various names, uh, but, uh, but essentially private commercial space stations being utilized for research and manufacturing. The ISS, by the way, is filled up right now. It's, uh, uh, it's science and research capacities that it's been expanded, but they're being totally utilized. Uh, and, and there's much more capacity um, that, needs, uh, that needs access to near space. So, uh, so here we have Sierra Nevada, uh, actually uh, Sierra Nevada Corporation's um, uh, prototype uh, for their Lunar Gateway. If you remember part of the original Artemis project was to put a, a Lunar Gateway in orbit around the, the moon uh, for the arrival of astronauts. And from that Lunar Gateway, uh, then astronauts would uh, reach the moon. Uh, and this was a, a this is a prototype being tested. As you can see, it says 2019 uh, at NASA uh, at NASA's facility itself, a, a uh, inflatable habitat. Um, so uh, now that's the gateway. We'll come back to Sierra Nevada in a, in a moment. Uh, another major project going on right now uh, is the utilization of the Bishop Airlock, which has been built by NanoRack. Uh, like Sierra Nevada, NanoRex has been around for uh, numbers of years. It's been around since uh, 2009. Uh, uh, and uh, the Bishop Airlock is the first commercial uh, unit deployed on the space station. Um, in the center of the picture there, uh, you see the Bishop Airlock. In other words, it locks into the space, space station pro uh, proper is loaded and then uh, maneuvered uh, by, by a robotic arm uh, into a location uh, from which um, uh, satellites can be released. Uh, the boxes that you see on either side of the Bishop airlock itself, those are uh, experiments, science experiments going on uh, that can be exposed to, uh, uh, to uh, to outer space, to cosmic radiation, um, as as part of their uh, as part of their experimental regimes, uh, these are some of the features. Uh, it substantially increased the the capacity of the space station for research projects. Uh, but this was developed by NanoRacks, a company uh, based here in in uh, Houston, um, Houston, Texas, um, and moving on. NanoRax uh, is going to be launching its first outpost mission next month. Uh, that, uh, you see the picture of that on the left, uh, the, uh, the launching uh, and the release of the outpost. That outpost will demonstrate the first ever robotic cutting of a second stage uh, uh, tank, space grade tank materials, that is uh, fuel tank. Why? Because NanoRax intends to build uh, what they call outposts, space stations, out of a, existing um, upper stages in orbit right now. In other words, space debris, large space debris to uh, use robotic, um, not just cutting, but robot, robotic uh, uh, tools uh, to uh, cut and assemble uh, an array of outpost, uh, outposts for research uh, in, in space. 
Again, NanoRacks, uh, if you follow some of our presentations before or, or have followed the space program, you know that uh, NanoRacks has been involved uh, in uh, running research facilities on the ISS. It's the biggest commercial uh, operator on the International Space Station. So they're not new kids on the block, but this is the project they're launching uh, just next month, uh, if all goes uh, according to schedule. Also, as you see there then, you see, and it may look familiar to you, you see Sierra Nevada Space, that company is being spun off of the Sierra Nevada Corporation. Sierra Nevada Space has the Dream Chaser, uh, like a, 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 a mini uh, shuttle. It's about one quarter the size of the, spo uh, the full space shuttle that we know uh, from the program that was shut down by uh, 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 Barack Obama, um, which led to the campaign for his impeachment led by among others by Keisha Rogers. Um, the Dream Chaser uh, is now prepared and will launch in 2022 uh, um, from uh, uh, from uh, from uh, uh, the Kennedy Space Center that's been announced by NASA. It will carry cargo. It's authorized at this point for cargo to the Inter International Space Station. And then it will return under its own power uh, to Earth and land on the runway at one of the runways at the Kennedy Space Center. This is Axiom Space, what you're seeing now. Axiom Space is another major company, uh, a newer company uh, since 2016. Uh, it will launch the first commercial uh, space module. Uh, imagine one of those modules. It looks like something like one of those modules uh, of the series that are attached there uh, to the International Space Station in January of 2020, uh, 2022, next year, a really a matter of six, seven months uh, from now. Um, this is Axiom Mission 1 to be followed by, in the same year, Axiom Mission 2 and 3, and so on and so forth. The, the, the following two will occur also in 2022. Um, uh, this will be the first um, commercial and uh, let me get the, uh, uh, the terminology here. First commercial destination module to the International Space Station. It will carry uh, four uh, individuals uh, led by a, a trained astronaut that's been hired by Axiom. Um, and it will carry out scientific and other work out the space station. It will be a commercial entity operating at the space station. Uh, from there, that Axiom segment uh, can be built out to additional Axiom segments. Um, I, but I don't wanna get too far ahead of ourselves here. But what you're seeing now, this picture, is Axiom's uh, plans for building out its own space station. What Axiom intends to do is build out a segmented um, section of its own modules on the space station. Uh, and then uh, at whatever point the uh, lifespan of the ISS is uh, uh, determined to have been, uh, to have run its course, that, that system of Axiom modules will separate out and become a self-sustaining new space station of its own. So you might say 2025, 2026, uh, in terms of a rough time frame, but this is being done in close coordination with NASA. Uh, and to give you an idea, Charles Bolden, uh, the former director of NASA, uh, is among the key uh, figures in Axiom Space, along with a number of former astronauts. And uh, so this is a major project, part of this ongoing at this moment. Uh, development for the commercialization, but it's more than commercialization. It's the building out of a broad manufacturing as well as research platform uh, in low earth orbit uh, for our nation. Um, so uh, that's a bit on Axiom. Now, Sierra Nevada, coming back to Sierra Nevada space, Sierra Nevada Corporation 
uh, has been around since, um, uh, uh, well, let's see, 1963. Uh, it's a major, major uh, aerospace firm and, uh, and national security leader, as they put it. Uh, they uh, work closely with Air Force on numerous projects. They've been involved in over 500 separate missions. They have 5,000 employees. In other words, this is a major outfit. You saw earlier their gateway uh, prototype. Well, they're continuing to expand and develop on that project uh, or, or that prototype uh, to develop what they term their life inhabitable inflatable habitats that you see here, one on the left. You can see the size of it. They're three stories tall, you know, literally three stories inside, uh, including a uh, astral garden system uh, uh, as, as a component of these, uh, of these inflatable habitats. On the screen on the right, you see the building out of their space station uh, linked uh, linking up a number of these habitats, so you get the idea. This these could this could be an extraordinary large facility built out over time. Uh, these uh, uh, life inhabitable habitats are all being tested by NASA. All of this commercialization is all under the under the umbrella, in a certain sense, or under the wing of NASA. It has to meet NASA specifications. You know, this isn't some guy in the, in the backyard deciding to shoot himself out of a cannon. This is a, a, a very uh, intensively coordinated uh, process involving consultation and uh, advice uh, and, uh, uh, and, and obviously a lot of sharing uh, of ideas, uh, new ideas. So uh, again, here, here you have another in addition to Axiom, in addition to Nanorax, uh, another uh, uh, manufacturing uh, space station system being developed, in this case, by uh, Sierra Nevada. And this, uh, this space station will be serviced by the Dream Chaser, the uh, shuttle, the mini shuttle, if you will, that we saw earlier. Um, the, the Dream Chaser will be upgraded uh, for astronauts as well as cargo, and you you see it uh, pictured here um, uh, in the uh, in the uh, uh, schematic uh, on the right hand side, uh, taking off, if you will, from the uh, from the space station uh, to return to Earth. Now, uh, to get at another uh, 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 feature of this, um, uh, uh, Sierra Nevada has just. Uh, announced a contract with another firm or group of firms, if you will, uh, with Redwire uh, Deep Space Systems, made in space. They're all combined under Redwire now. And Redwire uh, and it, its grouping, this grouping, will provide manufacturing capability uh, to the Sierra Nevada Space Station. So they've, uh, they've just reached an in-space manufacturing agreement. And so that's moving ahead. Made, made in Space has produced six of the major manufacturing facilities that now exist on the International Space Station. That's part of Redwire now. Um, uh, the specialization of, the, of, of this grouping is robotics, additive manufacturing, um, and uh, just to note it, uh, Made in Space was, uh, produced the first 3D printer that was utilized on the International Space Station. So, uh, and, uh, and we'll, we may have an opportunity to come back to that a, a little bit later. But uh, what I want to do now is move quickly to just some of the, some of what's being, the, 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 the ideas are, oh, and, and this is NanoRack Star Lab uh, uh, Space Farming Center. So um, University of Arizona has a lot of competition uh, on the, uh, uh, on, on the uh, agricultural side, if you will. A lot of work is going on in this area. Um, this is being, Nanorax is de developing the Star Lab Space Farming Center with Abu Dhabi. Um, and um, 
so uh, just just a, another window. You can see the uh, the uh, uh, terraced growing areas there inside the uh, farming center. But moving on here to what's otherwise being developed uh, for the the uh, for the space station for these uh, uh, for these uh, modules uh, and link modules uh, outposts and so forth as, as others call them. Um, first, 3D bioprinting. Uh, I, I chose this diagram not because it's the most comprehensive, but I thought it was the most accessible uh, to give you an idea of bioprinting uh, living cells. This is on the nanoscale. This, uh, these droplets are, are a fraction of the width of a, of, of a hair. And, uh, what has uh, been developed uh, quite successfully, uh, particularly over the last two years, is uh, the growing of, of living uh, tissue, vascular tissue, heart tissue, and, and uh, there's other examples, uh, uh, through so-called 3D or additive manufacturing bioprinting. And you see here, uh, I, I think it's pretty clear from the schematic, um, this is a submerged bioprinting underwater, but think about in microgravity, it's as if uh, it was in water, you know, it's uh, being suspended in microgravity. And uh, so you're laying down uh, the hydrogel uh, droplets in which the, the cells are, uh, the living cells, these are living uh, blood cells of, of specific types, T cells and so forth, um, uh, in hydrogel. You're laying down layers and then layer upon layer and building it up um, uh, vertically in space. And because of the microgravity, uh, very little or, or no um, uh, kind of um, uh, structure is required, fabricated structure is required uh, for these, uh, these uh, systems to be self-sustaining. And of course, the cells then grow out of the hydrogel and they link up with each other and they become uh, complete tissue. And so you can see this process. This is the process by which organs will be uh, grown and developed. Uh, already tissue is being developed that is utilized on earth as well as in space uh, for research uh, projects, including testing of vaccines and uh, for other such uses. Um, uh, uh, because, of course, these living cells, human cells, uh, are, are uh, closely mimic uh, the actual living tissue in human beings. Uh, and so it brings us much closer to the actual um, circumstances in which uh, various uh, vaccines, drugs, uh, and so forth would be utilized. Uh, and you can imagine the use of this in, in testing for space radiation, and, and many other uh, uses, but we're going in the direction rapidly in terms of uh, developing uh, 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 growing organs and, um, and a cellular tissue, living tissue for uh, um, uh, various uh, oper for purposes of, of carrying out uh, medical operations. Here is a tech shot. Uh, this is a, TechShot was the first U.S. company to grow um, uh, uh, heart tissue, uh, uh, in, in this case, but to grow tissue, bioprint tissue on the moon. This is what the actual uh, uh, tool you, looks like. You may, that may look a little abstract and, and, uh, uh, and so forth uh, from here, but uh, keep in mind the prior diagram in terms of what uh, the process is going on uh, inside. Here is uh, an astro astronaut load uh, loading media bags um, uh, into uh, TechShot's biofab facility. Uh, so this is, this is the process uh, of testing that's been going on uh, in, uh, in microgravity on the International Space Station. The implications of this, I mean, uh, as we've spoken about before, um, tens of thousands of people every year go without transplants because transplants are not available. 
organs are not available. The ability to grow organs uh, would be a boon uh, for, uh, for mankind, for, man, for our longevity of our citizens, uh, as, as well as uh, advancing our knowledge more fundamentally uh, in the biosciences. Uh, here is, uh, if we can get on to the next slide, yes, lamb division. Lamb division out of Boston uh, is developing uh, tiny, as it says here, protein-based retinal implants. Uh, you know about monocular uh, degeneration. Um, uh, there's not a solution for that. Um, but yet these tiny implants uh, of uh, a, a, a artificial, but actually protein-based, that is living retinal implant is a potential solution. And NASA is funding Lamb Division along with Space Tango, which is, um, which is providing the R&D to, to uh, make the project work on the space station itself. Lamb Division is now producing retinas uh, on, the, uh, on the space station. Um, this picture shows uh, the president of, of uh, of uh, Lamb Division working in their laboratory here in, on Earth in Boston. Uh, and uh, you see in the foreground uh, flask containing the, uh, the protein, um, which is found in very salt water like the, the Dead Sea, um, uh, which then is grown and uh, as in bioprinting is, is, is uh, uh, the uh, protein are, are laid down in layers to build up a, uh, a functioning retina, which then can be transplanted. So again, this is possible uh, under, uh, under conditions of microgravity in which these structures, very sensitive, delicate structures can be built up. Now, here's another area. Um, uh, uh, crystals, um, uh, and, and this kind of gives you a kind of clear, I think, uh, uh, contrast in the development of crystals on Earth, uh, where you see the uh, introduction of, of uh, foreign material into the development of crystals uh, because of the way in which they grow, irregular growth patterns, uh, and then on the right, what occurs in terms of the growth of crystals, both organic and inorganic, or inorganic crystals, they're now being worked with on the space station. Um, in terms of the more um, regularized process by which uh, uh, crystal growth is, is possible. Now this is, you know, this has very real uh, practical implications. Uh, uh, KPD uh, crystals, that's potassium, Dihydrox, uh, high, high, uh, uh, potassium dihydro, uh, dihydrogen phosphate, excuse me, um, uh, crystals are grown on Earth, but they, uh, they have uh, imperfections built in them. As a result, their use in lasers, specialized lasers, the imperfections lead uh, to their, uh, to their, to, the, to those crystals being damaged and having to be replaced rapidly over time. Uh, what are now being developed, what's now being developed on the space station is a means of producing KPD, KDP crystals uh, on the space station. Uh, and this goes also to the, uh, to the uh, issue of, of metal, the production of metal alloys uh, in uh, uh, space manufacturing. Um, uh, metal alloys, uh, you know a metal alloy uh, in steel. You, you take iron and you add some carbon uh, and um, heating and, and blending the two together and you get steel. Um, well, there's a whole array obviously of, um, of uh, alloys that can be produced, but what they find is that there's many more types of alloys that are producible in a, a low gravity, microgravity um, 
uh, circumstance. This is an example of a manganese alloy that's been developed by Dr. Okumta. Um, and uh, 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 this, this uh, manganese oil uh, alloy uh, utilizing, cas uh, uh, utilizing um, calcium as well as other materials in it uh, as approximately the same uh, density as, as, as the uh, human bone. And uh, this manganese alloy, which can't be produced on earth, uh, uh, manganese is a, a, a very heat sensitive metal, but uh, in a, uh, in a uh, microgravity, manganese uh, blended with calcium and uh, other specific materials um, uh, can, be, can be melded together without separation, which is a, a critical problem. If you have the separation out of the different elements uh, in a given alloy you're trying to produce, it weakens the material, it introduces uh, pores into the structure and so on and so forth. Um, uh, uh, this manganese alloy uh, is being developed uh, on the space uh, station in, con in conjunction with nanoracks, I believe, um, for utiliz utilization in, uh, in, in future operations and future uh, uh, medical procedures. Uh, but this is just one example. Uh, there's the area of so-called entropic alloys. Uh, alloys are often just, you know, two or three at most uh, elements brought together. Well, what about four, five, six? What are the potentials of the entire what we know today of the uh, of the uh, table of uh, elements? What are the, all the possibilities of that on Earth? But then, what are the possibilities under microgravity? So th this is an open-ended area of of ongoing research and development. Uh, and uh, enormous potential. Now, just moving rapidly to cis, the cislunar space, we were talking about what's been going on in the space station, and I hope giving you some idea of the potentials for development of manufacturing in low Earth orbit or near or new near Earth orbit, as being developed by now a number of commercial companies working closely with NASA. Um, the moon comes into this in a very important way. Uh, and this uh, mosaic of the moon, uh, it's explained there, uh, brings out the composition of the lunar surface, not, not its uh, internal uh, structures and mineral content, but the uh, composition of the lunar surface itself. Just to throw into, just to give you a sense of the enormous uh, mineral wealth of the moon. Um, uh, you're talking about aluminum, calcium, magnesium, iron, silicone, uh, oxygen, 45% of the moon's regolith, that is the moon's dirt, uh, is oxygen by weight. I think that surprises many people. Uh, there's also, the, the determination of hydrogen and uh, probable water at the poles, particularly the South Pole, as, you, as I think everyone is aware of. Titanium, uh, these are all available on the moon. Now, what's the importance here? Uh, a, a singular importance besides the development of, of the moon and colonization of the moon itself as an extension of man's frontiers, man's uh, domain. Uh, is the uh, is that the moon utilizing advanced uh, nuclear tugs, for example, tugs uh, rocket um, uh, uh, cargo carrying um, uh, vehicles traveling to and from the moon and low Earth orbit uh, can bring those tugs can bring minerals as well as uh, helium three uh, to uh, to low Earth orbit for utilization and manufacture at a order of magnitude less cost than moving raw materials from the Earth 
up into near near orbit. So the, the moon is going to be a major source for the development of manufacturing in low earth orbit. And I really want to emphasize this as a uh, important aspect of uh, this. In other words, we're talking about here the development of cislunar space, that is the space between Earth and the Moon, and uh, uh, and uh, so this is uh, this is going to be uh, uh, very important. It's also a rehearsal for deep space missions uh, going on to Mars. Uh, the development of nuclear powered space tugs. Uh, this is already being promoted now officially under. Uh, Space Directive 6, signed by President Trump, uh, and a number of companies are working on them. Uh, you have a uh, company called Space Nukes, uh, a spinoff of Los Alamos, uh, USNC Tech, uh, Next Gen, uh, BWX Technologies, Rolls-Royce in Britain, teaming up with a UK partnership, uh, DARPA, of the Department of Defense. The DARPA uh, folks have already chosen Lockheed Martin and Blue Origin to uh, working with General Atomics to develop uh, a nuclear powered uh, space vehicle. So, uh, so this is moving ahead rapidly. And uh, finally, I just wanna mention in terms of the moon on the far side of the moon, from the moon, we're gonna look out into the universe as well in an entirely, and see it in an entirely different way. The potential for radio telescopes, there's now at least three di uh, competing different concepts of this uh, in the United States, not to mention what's being developed in China and elsewhere. Um, but uh, space tele tele telescopes are most likely now going to be integrated as a feature of uh, of Project Artemis. Uh, you have the Vipers uh, project, you have Heracles, which is uh, uh, NASA working with the European Union. These are robotic missions to the moon that will be preceding uh, the landing of astronauts on, back on the moon again, uh, projected by the Trump administration for 2024. That's gonna be a battle dealing with the uh, Biden collective. Uh, but the uh, uh, but these as part of these robotic missions, uh, it's likely that they will roll out. In this case, a uh, space tele uh, telescope utilizing an existing crater, where robots will will uh, roll out the uh, um, uh, the net, shall we say, of, of that telescope. Uh, and there's there's other versions as well. Um, uh, so, uh, so I, I just want to, I think, conclude here by, uh, by returning to Kraft Erika, our, our good friend, uh, space pioneer, uh, creator of the Centaur rocket. Um, you have the, uh, uh, the new United launch uh, system going up the Vulcan Centaur. The first stage is being powered by the BE-4 engines being developed by Blue Origin. But the, the second stage is the Centaur, uh, designed by Kraft Erika, still utilized today. And he stated these three fundamental laws of that, uh, astronautics. Uh, the first law, no one, nobody and nothing under the natural laws of this universe impose any limitations on man except man himself. Secondly, not only the Earth, but the entire solar system and as much of the universe as he can reach under the laws of nature are man's rightful field of activity. And the third law, by expanding through the universe, man fulfills his destiny as an element of life, endowed with the power of reason and the wisdom of the moral law within himself. And I think that still encapsulates uh, the uh, uh, the outlook, um, which uh, which in his day uh, 
uh, galvanized uh, the Kennedy moonshot, and uh, which today can galvanize our efforts. Uh, it's going to take a lot of work. Uh, the Biden collective has no intention, as, as Keisha indicated, to go forward with this perspective, but it's already being launched, uh, as I hope I've shown. And if we can build on that and uh, uh, leverage that, uh, we can move uh, mankind uh, to a new, profoundly new uh, economic platform. So thank you for your attention and um, look forward to further discussions.